Merci. So welcome everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. And I wish to thank the organizers for the opportunity of giving this presentation. So I'm here to talk to you on uh, how we can use non-invasive brain stimulation to assess the function of specific cortical circuits in different forms of dementia. And I believe this is one field in neurophysiology that is most likely in the next year to have a translation from the experimental to the clinical settings, especially for the diagnosis of pathologies associated with central cholinergic dysfunction. The way to test non-invasive, uh, the excitability of the brain in, in uh, awake human subjects is provided by transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, that was first introduced by Barker and colleagues in 1985 by making advantage of the reciprocal interaction between the electric and magnetic field. And this is actually how TMS physically works. We have uh, an electric current flowing through an electromagnetic coil. This generates a magnetic field, and it in turn induces an electric field in the cerebral cortex. Uh, this electric field is responsible for local depolarization of the underlying neurons. And if we deliver uh, TMS uh, uh, with a focal coil, you can see from this modeling study how the uh, electric field is limited to a restricted area of the cerebral cortex, so we can be quite uh, focal in the stimulation with uh, a good enough spatial resolution of one centimeter, this uh, midline between the um, MRI and the EEG resolution. So uh, the most common way of applying TMS is to the motor cortex because it, it is easy to measure the effects of stimulation of the motor cortex uh, by evoked muscular activity. But we have now several protocols of TMS uh, that we can use uh, to go beyond the study of the pyramidal system. These uh, protocols are single pulse stimulation protocols to test the excitability of the stimulated area. Uh, they can be per pulse stimulation protocols with a couple of pulses of different intensities uh, with specific interstimulus intervals, uh, or can even be repetitive TMS protocols to test the short-term plastic properties of the stimulated area. But I will focus today my presentation on some uh, per pulse stimulation protocols uh, that are getting very high attention uh, for the role in the assessment of some specific intracortical circuits in dementia. These are the intracortical inhibition and facilitation protocols and the afferent inhibition protocol. These allow for the selective exploration of central glutamatergic, GABAergic, and cholinergic circuits in the brain. When we deliver single pulse focal TMS to the motor cortex, uh, the first parameter that we can measure is the motor threshold uh, that is uh, measured as, this, as the stimulus, uh, uh, the, the minimum stimulus intensities, intensity uh, needed to evoke a motor evoke potential in the muscle. And this is a basic measure of uh, cortical excitability. If we increase the stimulation intensity, we get larger motor evoke potentials from the muscle, and we can even make a, a recruitment curve or a stimulus response curve uh, representing the amplitude of evoked motor responses in function of the stimulation intensity. And this is another way to measure cortical excitability. These uh, um, um, measures of cortical excitability as ma are mainly related to uh, excitatory glutamatergic uh, uh, systems. Now, coming to uh, per pulse stimulation protocol, um, a first phenomenon uh, that was observed by Kujirai in 1993 is the uh, intracortical inhibition and facilitation phenomena. Uh, they are produced by a paired stimulation of the motor cortex uh, by using a couple of pulses, 
delivered to the same point of the scalp if the uh, first conditioning subthreshold stimulus is followed by a test magnetic stimulus of the motor cortex of an interval between uh, 1 to 5 milliseconds, uh, we have inhibition of the motor evoked potential, while if the conditioning stimulus uh, precedes the test stimulus uh, of uh, 10 to 25 milliseconds, uh, we have intracortical facilitation. And these are phenomena mediated by inhibitory and excitatory cortical circuits, and specifically by circuits bearing the GABA-A receptors and the NMDA glutamate receptors. Another uh, very important protocol in the evaluation of dementia for the assessment of cholinergic circuits is represented by the phenomenon of short latency afferent inhibition. Uh, this is a sensory motor integration process that is characterized by inhibition of the motor response by an afferent stimulus delivered to a peripheral nerve. Um, you can see if we um, deliver a test magnetic stimulus preceded by uh, an afferent uh, nerve stimulation, uh, we can get an inhibition of the motor response if the interstimulus interval is sufficient for the afferent stimulus to reach the somatosensory and then the motor cortex. This uh, does not happen if we use uh, electrical brain stimulation instead of magnetic stimulation. And this is probably due to the fact that the electrical stimulation activates the axons of corticospinal cells instead of uh, uh, activating uh, transsynaptically intracortical circuits as happens with TMS. So this is a demonstration that the phenomenon happens at a cortical level. We usually measure afferent inhibition as a ratio between uh, conditioned motor response and test motor response. The interstimulus intervals that produce uh, an inhibition of the motor response uh, were characterized in the paper by Tokimura in 2000 and uh, correspond, sorry, and correspond to uh, interstimulus intervals between 2 uh, and 8 milliseconds following the latency of the somatosensory evoked potential produced by the afferent stimulation. And interestingly, uh, it was also provided evidence uh, from direct uh, um, epidural recording at the corticospinal tract uh, that this phenomenon um, happens at a cortical level. Uh, these recordings were made uh, from epidural electrodes implanted in some patients for the treatment of pain, and we can observe that at the intervals where we have inhibition of the peripheral motor response, we also have a reduction of the later components of the corticospinal descending volley. We see that scopolamine, that is a muscarinic receptor, cholinergic receptor antagonist, reduces uh, afferent inhibition, while the afferent inhibition is increased in Alzheimer's disease patients by the administration of uh, uh, the anticholinesterase drug rivastigmine. So this led to the assumption that uh, in afferent inhibition depends on the activity of central cholinergic circuits. And uh, we also made uh, a model of how the afferent input can modulate uh, uh, the uh, corticospinal output uh, um, based on uh, a canonical uh, circuit model. Um, we hypothesized that the afferent inputs get the motor cortex uh, uh, from the thalamus and it reaches some GABAergic inhibitory circuits within the motor cortex that are responsible for the inhibition of the P5 pyramidal uh, cells that produce the output of the motor cortex. But the picture is actually made quite more complicated by uh, the observation that benzodiazepines that uh, generally increase the intracortical inhibition, 
produce a dissociate effect on afferent inhibition. And in particular, we have diazepam that increases afferent inhibition in uh, some cases, but we have lorazepam and zolpidem that decrease afferent inhibition. Uh, and we know that zolpidem has a, a more selective effect on alpha-1 subunit, but little is known on the selective effect of uh, diazepam and lorazepam on the specific subunits of the mm, GABA-A receptor. But we uh, can hypothesize, just hypothesize, based on these pharmacological effects, uh, that we have at least two inhibitory GABA circuits that modulate the cholinergic circuit function, and then uh, another GABA circuit that is responsible for the inhibitory effect on the cortical motor output produced by afferent uh, stimulation. And uh, these GABA circuits must be different from those producing intracortical inhibition. Now, going to uh, dementia, uh, the, the main rationale for the use of these electrophysiological tests uh, to assess the function of specific circuits in uh, dementia comes from uh, um, the knowledge from uh, post-mortem studies that uh, um, we have an empirical transmission in some forms of dementia mainly Alzheimer's disease and dementia with levy bodies, uh, while the cholinergic uh, function uh, seems to be preserved in frontotemporal dementia or vascular dementia. So uh, we uh, performed a series of studies in the laboratory headed by Professor Di Lazzaro in Rome, starting from about 15 years ago, to assess the function of cholinergic circuits in specific forms of dementia. And um, as you can observe, a first finding was that in Alzheimer's disease patients, we have uh, an impaired uh, afferent inhibition process. Uh, this is significantly uh, lower than in uh, control subjects. While in frontotemporal dementia, we have a normal afferent inhibition. This is coherent with the fact that uh, um, Alzheimer's disease is, con is considered a cholinergic form of dementia, while uh, frontotemporal dementia is not. Uh, so this uh, test uh, was proven to be sensitive to the, to the central cholinergic dysfunction in these specific forms of uh, dementia. And uh, we can observe, this was a, a small sample of 20 subjects, we can observe how uh, uh, already at that time the, the test was able to distinguish uh, Alzheimer's disease from control subjects with uh, a, a sensitivity of 80%. Um, another uh, finding was that uh, the, the motor threshold was decreased in Alzheimer's disease that was al already known, and this is related to an increased cortical excitability in Alzheimer's disease uh, that might be explained by an imbalance between uh, impaired NMDA glutamate transmission and uh, possibly enhanced AMPA-mediated glutamate transmission. Another finding at that time was that uh, the administration of the uh, anticholinesterase drug rivastigmine tended to restore uh, a normal afferent inhibition level in Alzheimer's disease patients. And uh, patients that had uh, um, a response to rivastigmine measured by afferent inhibition were also the patients uh, who showed uh, uh, a better clinical response to chronic cholinergic therapy. So uh, this uh, mm, pharmacological test can be predictive of clinical response to chronic cholinergic therapy in Alzheimer's disease patients. Now, uh, a confirmation, a very recent confirmation of the possibility of distinguishing Alzheimer's disease from frontotemporal dementia based on 
afferent inhibition testing uh, comes from a, a very recent study published by Alberto Benussi uh, and uh, colleagues from the Universities of Brescia and the Institute of Santa Lucia in Rome just last summer. Uh, these data were also showed yesterday by Alessandro Padovani. Uh, here we have a confirmation that Alzheimer's disease can be distinguished from healthy controls uh, based on the test of afferent inhibition. Uh, but there is another uh, finding that uh, frontotemporal dementia can also be distinguished from healthy control based on the study of intracortical inhibition and facilitation. Both processes uh, were found to be impaired in frontotemporal dementia compared to controls and compared to Alzheimer's disease patients. And in particular, the authors propose uh, uh, the ratio between uh, CKI, ICF, and afferent inhibition as a parameter to distinguish uh, Alzheimer's disease from frontotemporal dementia with a sensitivity of about 92% and a specificity of about 89%. Um, now, going back to some older studies, we also tested uh, the cholinergic function in uh, other forms of dementia. In uh, dementia we, with levy bodies, uh, we expected a cholinergic dysfunction, and actually in this uh, small group of 10 subjects, we found an impaired afferent inhibition uh, as we found in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Another uh, condition where we tested the cholinergic dysfunction was uh, vascular dementia. In vascular dementia, the pathological studies uh, generally do not show uh, an impairment of cholinergic pathways. And uh, we actually found uh, uh, a level of afferent inhibition that is not significantly different from uh, controls, while it is impaired, as I said, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we must note that in vascular dementia we have more variability of the measures and that m can be related to the difficulty to distinguish pure vascular dementia from forms of dementia that also have uh, some uh, degenerative components. Actually, some uh, later studies uh, showed variable results on uh, vascular dementia. Uh, there are some studies confirming that uh, the after inhibition is not modified uh, in uh, subcortical vessel disease uh, without microbleeds uh, and in a vascular cognitive impairment, while there are two studies in Cadacil uh, finding that uh, afferent inhibition is uh, uh, reduced. I want also to report the case of the study that we performed in acute stroke patients. In this case, we found an impaired cholinergic transmission in the affected hemisphere compared to the unaffected hemisphere and to healthy controls. Despite uh, a normal uh, afferent pathway, as uh, demonstrated by uh, the normality of the somatosensory evoked potentials, and despite uh, a substantial preservation of the main cholinergic pathways in the brain. So we can hypothesize that in this condition there is an impairment of uh, cholinergic function in some patients uh, due to uh, the interaction of other intracortical circuits, maybe the GABAergic circuits uh, with, uh, with the cholinergic circuits generating the process of show latency after an inhibition. Now, uh, we uh, have pointed our attention on the fact that we can use, uh, uh, that we can test uh, the function of specific intracortical circuits to make a differential diagnosis between different forms of dementia. Uh, but a key question that remains open is uh, 
can neurophysiological tests be also used as early biomarkers of uh, dementias? Actually, we applied the neurophysiological testing uh, to date in, uh, at some level of uh, cognitive impairment in uh, dementia. But to address this point, we should uh, also apply neurophysiological testing in mild cognitive impairment or even when there is no cognitive impairment, but just the alteration of other kinds of molecular biomarkers. And actually, uh, the same uh, group of Benussi and colleagues uh, presented some data in this Congress uh, uh, on uh, uh, a large number of MCI patients. And uh, this is, I think, the, the right direction to, to, to address this, uh, this point. So in summary, um, we have said that non-invasive brain stimulation in dementia allows for selective testing of central glutamatergic, GABAergic, and cholinergic circuits. The test of afferent inhibition is sensitive to this function of central cholinergic circuits, and it could be useful in the differential diagnosis between cholinergic forms of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, dementia with levy bodies, and non-cholinergic forms of dementia, such as frontotemporal dementia. Moreover, uh, the afferent inhibition can be altered in some forms of vascular encephal encephalopathy, probably because of the involvement of other non-cholinergic cortical circuits. The test of psi can also be predictive of clinical response to anticholinesterase therapy. The, intracortical, uh, the impairment of intracortical inhibition and facilitation uh, can be a further parameter to distinguish between uh, frontotemporal dementia and normal subjects and between frontotemporal and Alzheimer dementias. And finally, the electrophysiological testing might have a role as a biomarker in early forms of dementia, and this is a point that still needs to be addressed. Thank you.